Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. And if you're watching online, welcome to you as well. And you might even be watching this as one of your rockfish gatherings, so welcome to all of you. And by the way, you can find notes for all that we're going to do. If you have the Bible app or if you have uh, Rockfish Church online, you can find all the notes and the passages of Scripture we'll use. My name is Dan DeBruler, and it's a joy to be here. But before I tell you any of the stuff that I came here to tell you, I want to tell you about this guy I know named Larry. When Larry came to Christ, it was one of those things. And maybe you have been in one of those uh, denominational churches where they do the thing where at the end they say, they begin singing this song. And when they get to that last verse, they say, we're going to sing this one more time. And if nobody comes, then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrap this up. But then they sing it one more time and one more time, just as I am without one plea. And so I was at this one denominational church revival. And you know the kind I'm talking about if you grew up in this part of the country. Well, if you grew up just about anywhere. You know that, that Sunday night to Wednesday night, we're going to meet every night at 7 p.m. Sunday at 6, 7 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, they meet for a revival service. And so Larry, in one of these services, as they sang the chorus of Just As I Am for like the 318th time, Larry finally walked down the aisle, and he made his way to the front, and he got down on his knees, and other people placed their hands on his back, and he prayed to receive Jesus as his Savior. Man, it was a beautiful thing. But let me tell you about Larry, beyond him coming to Christ. Larry had been in that church from the time that we had gotten there. Larry was my age then, and that was at least 20 years ago, maybe longer than that. Larry was a respected man in the church. Larry's wife was a gospel singer, and he traveled all throughout the region as her sound guy. He was exposed to the gospel again and again and again. He sang about it. He talked about it. Larry was a deacon in his church. Yet Larry walked down the aisle when they sang Just As I Am one more time and gave his life to Christ. Can you imagine the humility that it took? Can you imagine the weight that must have been lifted off of his shoulders? All the years of facade, of pretending, of not knowing the joy that those people who did go give their lives to Christ knew. But Larry the deacon gave his life to Christ that night. And I share that, and it's odd, because on Wednesday night, you know, we come in here, everybody knows the songs. We're singing along at the top of our lungs. We're applauding when we see a baptism, because we're excited to see other people come into the family. Amen. But here's the deal. Just like with Larry, I don't know where you stand with Christ. You know, we're in this series and we're talking about equipping. We're talking about becoming better disciples. We're, we're learning what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Yet I don't know if you know Christ. I don't know if you're a Larry and you are faking it really, really well or not. And so I want to just back up a little bit. You know, we're talking, if you come, if you see our Sunday sermon series, Equipping Point, Man, you're going to learn some stuff. You're going to learn how to grow. You're going to learn how to engage Christ and engage the world around you. That's why we call it equipping point. We're equipping you to take Christ into the world. But I want to back up a little bit. I want to talk about what it means to know Christ. I want to talk about that journey, that road from belief, saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe he will forgive me. Even in my sins today, he will forgive the fact that I've been faking it all these years. I want to take a close look at that. I want to look at that journey. You know, if I could be anybody in the Bible, I think I would choose John, the Apostle John. If you read the Gospel of John, this whole book is written from the perspective of a man who wants to convince those who read this book 
that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is who he says he is. It's filled with all sorts of good stuff. And as we talk about this, this path, this journey from belief to discipleship, I'm going to discuss some of the milestones along the way. But let's think about this, this book of John. Now, if you've got your Bible with you and you want to open it, you could read to it, but let me suggest that even if you don't open it tonight, that you go home and sometime in the next few days you read through the Gospel of John and see if you agree, see if you believe what John is saying. I mean, he points to the signs. He points to the reasons to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He discusses the seven miracles of Jesus, the healing of the, the nobleman's son, the healing of the man at the pool, the feeding of the 5,000, all seven of the miracles that we know. John talks about those because he wants us to believe. He wants us to know what he knows. John, who walked with Jesus while he was in his ministry, he wants us to know that. And so the whole Gospel of John is devoted to convincing us through the facts that he knows that Jesus is who he says he is. He discusses the seven I am statements that Jesus made. And consider the fact that I am to the Hebrew world who he was surrounded by. I am was a God statement. I am that I am, God said. And he discusses those seven I am statements that Jesus made. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And more. Because he wants us to see Jesus for who he is. He wants us to believe what he knows to be true. And so this whole book is written to convince the reader that that's what's happening and if you look, if you can open your Bibles or get out your phone and say John 1, we'll, we'll look at these first five verses and see how closely it mirrors what we see in Genesis. Because he wants the people to understand that these people believe in the Hebrew Bible. They believe in all they know from those scrolls. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have these four gospels that we can look at. Thank you that John went to the painstaking effort to Lay this out the way that he did so that we might know that you are God and that Jesus is your son and that through him we all can have eternal life. I pray that you would open our eyes and open our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So looking at the milestones along the way. You know, in, in the days when Jesus walked the earth, there were people who ranged from the curious to the believers. People came around. They heard of the miracles. They heard of him feeding the 5,000. They heard of him healing people. They heard of maybe him raising Lazarus from the dead. And so they came around. They were curious. They wanted to know more. Yet still, they looked at this Jesus guy with a bit of a skeptical eye. Well, I don't know. He, yeah, he's doing a lot of stuff, but we have seen a lot of guys who put on a good show. Is he the son of God? Well, you know, in the word it says that we have always known. We know from creation itself that there's got to be something. There's got to be someone. There's something more, something beyond ourselves. Amen. And so as we go through this gospel of John, he begins to unfold that. He begins to point to those signs. Again, those miracles, the so many things that happen within that gospel, within that three-year period that John walked with Jesus in his ministry. He saw it up close. He knew it to be true, and he wants us to know that it's true as well. And in the modern day, 
We do a lot. We do a lot of investigating. We do a lot of Google searches to find things out. And science devotes itself seemingly to prove that these things are true, but in many ways they're really seeking to disprove because man ultimately does not want someone else to be in charge. We want to be the authority. We want to have the final word. So we look for ways to make it not true. One such man in Jesus' time was a man named Nicodemus. Now, this was a, a leader of the Pharisees. This is, this is the Pharisee who taught Pharisees. This was a man who knew the Word of God inside out to the extent that he was teaching others how to teach the Word of God. Yet, this man saw all that Jesus was doing. He began to recognize some of the things that were lining up with prophecy about this man, Jesus. And so when we get to chapter 3 in the book of John, before we get to John 3.16, that everybody knows, for God so loved the world, before we get there, Jesus has this encounter with a man who sought him out, a wise man man who wanted to know more. He wanted to investigate for himself. And so Nicodemus is there. He agrees or arranges to meet Jesus at night because a man of his stature, he can't be seen going talking to this ragtag dude that's got a handful of disciples. He's not even sanctioned by the church of the day. So he arranges to meet with, with Jesus and Nicodemus and he meet, and they begin to have this discussion, and he begins asking some really hard questions, and Jesus is trying to explain to him how we must be born again. And, and this completely baffles Nicodemus. He doesn't understand, and so he asks even further, and Jesus, the basic response is that, if you don't even get this, how in the world are you teaching God's people? If you don't understand who God is, if you don't understand who I am, how are you teaching God's people? And then he begins to tell him about God's love and God's salvation. And that's when we get to this passage. That's when we arrive at John 3.16. Through that journey, that conversation investigating what Nicodemus has heard and what he has observed and what he knows of God. And so Jesus, in this passage that we quote so freely and put on T-shirts and stamp it on our favorite hats and carry on signs to football games, is Jesus kind of breaking it down. And let me, let me paraphrase. Forgive me, I'm not adding to the Bible. I just want to paraphrase this. It's like, look, Nicodemus, this is how God loved the world that he gave his only son. He sent me, his only son, into the world so that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in me, won't perish but have eternal life. Don't you get it? He's simply breaking down all that they have talked about in, in this discussion and all that Nicodemus has observed up to that point and attempting to answer his questions and provide some surety. And what I fear is that night Nicodemus walked away a broken man. He came this close to the truth. He was toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Son of God, yet he couldn't grab hold of it. He was doing all the things he spent his life. He devoted his life to finding out when the Messiah would come to understanding the prophecies, to knowing the signs and the times. And when he began to recognize them, but then he got close enough where he could say, you are him, aren't you? He walked away. And I fear that's what so many of us do. Even the Wednesday night crowd, even the Wednesday night sing along with all the songs, clap your hands between them crowd, I fear that sometimes we come so close and we do all the things. We're busy. We're teaching other people. We're helping other people find Christ through our community outreaches, through the things that we do at work, through the things that we say and the T-shirts that we wear. 
But have we really grabbed hold of who Jesus is? Do we really believe it? This is a question for all of us to look inside and answer tonight. I don't want any of us to walk away broken like I believe Nicodemus did that night. Now, there are some other stories in the Bible. He, he pops up again at the crucifixion of Jesus or after following the resurrection of Jesus. And so I have reason to believe that he came a little bit closer and maybe he, he did believe, but there's no solid evidence that he became a follower or a purveyor of the gospel at all. So I wonder if he was just a really good Larry, a guy who looked the part, who talked the part, and who even traveled around as part, but didn't really know Jesus as the Son of God. But once we've investigated, once we come to that place where we believe, where we say, you know what? There is something about this. I believe this is true. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died not just for everyone else in the world, but for me too. And we surrender our lives. We, we come to that point where we don't just ask for forgiveness, but we approach true repentance. Where we say, the things I have been doing, the life I have been living is absolutely contrary to what God wants for us in this world. And I'm going the other way. I'm doing a 180. That's repentance. Not when we just ask for forgiveness. It's when we determine we're not going to do those things anymore. The things that grieve God, the things that we know are wrong, the things that we find in the scripture that don't line up with who God is and what he's called us to in this world, we push those things away and we begin to follow unencumbered by the weight of all the sin, of all the shame, of all the hiding, of all the faking that we have been doing all this time and we begin to follow. And just like we saw tonight, we say, it's not just for me. I want everyone to know that I believe in Jesus Christ, that I believe he's the son of God, and we follow his example in baptism. And what does it say? In, in Acts chapter 2, we read this in verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say, th this wasn't necessarily the speaking tongues, prophesy Holy Spirit that we, we get kind of afraid of when we get up close for the first time. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the one that Jesus promised. Jesus said, I'm going away, but don't worry, I'm sending somebody. I'm sending you, what did he call him? He called him the comforter. He's sending us someone to be with us. And at the moment that we repent and are baptized, we receive this Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, and I, I regret saying the before Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, because it is an entity, it's a living entity. Holy Spirit helps us understand Scripture. Holy Spirit is our conscience. It's the one who lets us know when we should have turned left back there and maybe helps us get back on course. The one that lets us know how this life is really going and how we are living. He's the comforter. He's the helper, we read in John 16. And then we get to following as a disciple which is what we're talking about in our sermon series, Equipping Point. We're talking about what it means and what the life of a disciple looks like and how we get from this place of disbelief to belief and repentance and baptism and then on to following Jesus. But what does Jesus say? As he is leaving this earth, his, his disciples are there and he knows in a minute, they're going to be on their own. So what does he say? And I don't know how comforting this was at the moment, but this is what we call the great, <laughs> I just lost the great commission. <laughs> I lost the word. 
the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, uh, beginning at verse 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So his charge to us as he's making these disciples, as he's leaving these disciples seemingly on their own, he's already promised them that the Holy Spirit would be with him. But he's charging those men and women who were there as he departed earth for his home in heaven. Just as he's charging us who are reading and hearing this today, who have claimed the name of Jesus, who wear a cross because we believe, not just because they look cool. He's charging us with what we are to do. We're to go as disciples, and we're to make disciples. When we talk about equipping, that's what follows all of this. We go and we make disciples. We tell people what we know. We tell them what we learned when we read John. We told them what we agreed with. We told them that we know that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for all of mankind and that he is the door. He's the good shepherd. He is the way and he's the only way to heaven because it says no man comes to the Father but through me. So we are saying to people, when we are making disciples, I agree with this. I believe this. This is who I am. This is my identity now. And we're to baptize them. As they become believers, as we, as John did for us, as we convince them that this is true, our next charge is to baptize them. To baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there. We don't just go out and get them saved and get them dunked. It says we're to teach them because we have Holy Spirit living within us. We understand the Word in a way that we didn't before. So we are fully equipped to do all that we're charged to do because of our belief and because of the Holy Spirit. So we begin teaching them what we have learned to be true and teaching them to observe those same things. We become equippers. We become those who are helping others grow as disciples. This is how multiplication works rather than simple addition. If I tell you and I tell you, and you go, and you tell to each. That's the very basis of multiplication. This is how the early church grew, and this is how the church continues to grow. It's through us, you and me, being honest, actually believing what we read here, accepting that as our identity, surrendering our will to God's will, following in baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit and learning more and more about who God really is and then sharing that with others. It's that simple. This is what we're here to do. And, you know, we have found a way to make this equipping, this preparing, this getting ready to go, we found a way to make it into a nine-week sermon series. So we're really breaking it down. Because the basis is we believe, and then we follow, and then we tell others. That's what it's really about. It's about us being who we're told to be, who we're called to be, who we're commanded to be. And that doesn't mean any of it is easy, because what does he say? Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. There will most definitely be challenges along the way. Can anybody testify? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I raised my hand nice and high. You know, and, and probably the, the first part, and, and you know, when we read, 
how Jesus called the disciples. And you'll, you'll see more of that in the book of Matthew. But when you, when you read how Jesus called the disciples and how they dropped everything and followed, that seems so bibly. But you know, for us, it really is like that. Because the things that we're doing today, the things that are contrary to God, when you begin to follow Christ, when you begin to truly believe this, when you repent and you turn and you begin to walk the other way spiritually, you don't even want those things anymore. It makes it hard to go back to work the first day. If you get saved on a Saturday, you've got to go back to work on Monday. You know, you don't want to go. You want to be a missionary. Because this, you're changed, you're different, you're a new man, you're a new woman. And it's hard to go back into that world that we struggle so much with. And the people who agreed with all the things that we were doing that were contrary to God, the people who cheered us on while we were doing them. So it's hard. It's hard to leave all of that behind. I mean, we develop habits. We come up with ways of coping, of destructive ways, many more destructive than we like to admit, but we're told to walk away from those things, to repent, and to begin to follow Jesus and to observe the things that he commanded. So the departure itself, leaving the past behind, is the first struggle we all encounter as Christ followers. When the excitement begins to ebb as the sun comes up on that work day or school day, everything becomes real again, and, and we may even wonder, are we, are we changed? Are, am I different? Is, was any of this real? Because all these people are still coming, still saying the same thing, still looking at me the same way. Because those things that we were doing had become our personality. It's not always as easy as just pick up and move. And then, of course, it's the day-to-day -day as we begin to live and walk. And, and the, the sting of those first few days back in our normal routine after we meet Christ as that sting begins to ebb a little bit and we kind of begin to ease in, we, we begin to see the world a little bit differently. And we know that we're different. We, we can feel that we're different. We look at things with different eyes and we feel things with different emotions because of who we are becoming. But it's not immediate. We aren't changed overnight. I've been walking with Christ for 40-some years, and I'm still being transformed. Man, I hope I'm a better man tomorrow than I was today, and that today maybe I was a little better than yesterday. I want to know Jesus. I want to do the things that, not just that don't grieve him, I want to do the things that please God, that please Jesus. I want to be who he was in this world to the world today. I mean, think about it, though. I mean, you know, with, uh, we, we, we want to change, we try to change, but think about how even on the, on the shore, we live here on, in a coastal state, so most of you have been to the beach more than once, and you know that you'll, you'll see things on the beach, and a, and a wave will come in, and a wave will wash back out, and you see some of the same things, but some of it's washed away, some of it's gone. There are residuals of, of who we have been that are there all the time. And we have got to continue to let that wave of God wash over us. We have got to continually allow God to wash us, to cleanse us, to be willing to have our sand shifted, to allow the change in our life. And change is good. But there's always going to be some sand there. There's still going to be some of you because as it turns out, we were all born human. And we can't escape the fact that we're human. We can't escape the fact that we were born with a sin nature, but we can change how we respond to things hour by hour, day by day. And the sad part about it all is that anybody, and I asked a few moments ago, got several hands raised, we know it ain't always easy. 
The Christian life is just tough sometimes. Anybody who tells you the Christian life is easy ain't living one. I promise. They are talking about one. They're, they're Larry before he got saved. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. You know, so many people are seeking to have the peace of God in their lives. We, we, want to, we want to have this God who's kind of in this box, and when we've got a problem, we go and we open the box, and we say a prayer to this God in the box, and we, we get the comfort that we need for the moment, and we close that box again. But man, you're not going to find the peace of God if you don't have peace with God. You have got to know him. If you want to live with, with peace, then you need to live in surrender. You need to live in surrender to the God of this universe. You need to surrender to Jesus Christ and begin to approach life with, with new eyes. Just read all the red letters. If you have a red letter edition of the Bible, read all the red letters in John 16. He tells us we're going to have tribulation. He says, but take heart. Don't worry. Don't be concerned. It's cool. I've overcome the world. Yeah, you're going to have problems. Things are going to come. Things came before, but we had ways of coping. We had ways that we dealt with the things that rubbed us the wrong way or that weren't what we liked. But in Christ, we're promised that because he overcame the world, so too have we overcome the world. Let me offer you a few passages here um, that you might want to write down, just jot them down perhaps for later. In Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, it says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. See, when it gets hard, Paul understood. When you read about Paul, when you, when you understand who he was and then who he was in Christ, this leader, this guy who was respected and revered and even charged with challenging the church of Jesus Christ in every way. And he became this humble man who learned how to walk with Christ instead of walking opposed to Christ. He learned about struggle real quick. And so when he says these things, he knows what he's talking about. You've got to press on. You've got to push on toward the prize because the prize is to know Christ nor more fully, and to eventually live with him eternally. And that may not be easy. Matthew 7, verses 21 and 22. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's enough to bring us back in line right there, but it continues. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? I think that's probably one of the more terrifying passages in the Bible, but it gets a little bit worse in the next verse because he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, we can fake it in front of our friends. We can fake it at the church. Larry figured out a way to be a deacon and a respected leader in his church. But when he came face to face with who he really was and who the Son of God was, he knew he didn't want to hear Jesus say, depart from me. Because it doesn't matter what I show you, what you show your husband or your wife or your children. What matters is what God knows to be true about you. This is where we all are. This is the charge for every single one of us, to truly know God, to truly repent, 
to be baptized and then to begin to live out the Great Commission, to go and to make disciples, to baptize them and begin the multiplication process in the circle that we live in. So I just want to ask you tonight, do you know Jesus? Have you truly accepted the things that we read about him to be true? Do you know that he gave his life for you? That he gave his life so that you could have eternal life, so that you could find yourself in heaven for all of eternity? It's a question we all have to answer. And whether we answer in this life or whether we don't, what are we going to do on Judgment Day? Because we all get one. Pray with me. Father God, we love you. And I pray that everyone in this room, Father, would truly look in the mirror, that they would look inwardly, and they would ask themselves, do I really know you? Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to every single one of us, that you would begin to make the words in the Bibles that we have so many of in our houses, the Bible that's on our phone, that you would begin to speak to them through your word, Father God, that we would come to know you more fully, that we would believe you completely, that we would repent, that we would turn from the things that we're doing in this life, Father God, and that we would begin to walk the other direction, the direction that leads to you. I pray that you would just be with us. Be with us in this moment. Be with us as we head out the door and go to our homes. Be with us as we head to work tomorrow or wherever we have to be tomorrow. And let us know that you're there. And if we're not walking with you today, I pray, Lord God, that you would draw us to you, that you would show us where we are failing you and that we might turn from that and begin to walk the other direction. Father, lead us to you. I pray for everyone as they leave tonight that they might have safe passage home. In Jesus' holy name, amen.